get back It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have Rick Popowitz, who's one of the top direct response marketers in the health industry. For the past 20 years, Rick has built two highly successful nutritional companies, one of which he sold to the Gold Shield Group, which is a London-based public pharmaceutical company. He's currently founder and CEO of Biocentric Health, which is an Inc. 5000 company. He has launched over 47 new products. He created powerful response and profit-driven direct marketing on and offline, which we're going to hear about. And collectively, his companies have mailed nearly 1 billion pieces and have generated over 35 million phone calls. I have to find out how you even Uh, answered all those calls. He's also co-founder and chairman of the Coalition for Dietary Supplements, which was founded by 30 direct-to-consumer supplement companies to have a voice in Congress on behalf of supplement issues and consumer rights. Rick, thanks for joining me. Well, Dr. Jeremy, it's a pleasure. I I look forward to today's talk. Pleasure is mine. And I always like to start off with a fun fact. Rick, and a fun fact about you, you have a great story with you and Henry Kissinger. Tell me yes. about that. Yes. Um, I, I didn't grow up thinking that I would be a direct response marketer. It wasn't on my list. It was first um, the senator from New York State, the state that I grew up in. And then secondly, it was to become uh, the secretary of state. I always dream big. Hmm. And so I went to graduate school at Georgetown University and had the pleasure of being able to take a seminar with Dr. Henry Kissinger, who had been my idol. Hmm. And uh, he wrote his biography while I was there, and um, one day made himself available to sign it. And the book had just come out, and it was, I believe, January 2nd, 1980, and he signed his name, you know, Best Wishes, Henry A. Kissinger, Alfred Kissinger. And he signed the date, January 2nd, 1979. It was two days past 1979. It was now 1980. So I said, excuse me, Dr. Kissinger, you know, I tried to be respectful. Would you sign, would you change the date to 1980 and would you initial it? So he politely signed the, uh, the date 1980, but laughed at me and said, no initials for you. <laughs> what was he like? He was, he's brilliant. He, um, he knows that he's brilliant. He has an incredible mind. Um, he is responsible for bringing the United States and Russia together through a rapprochement. The same thing with um, China. He did it with Vietnam. Uh, he did some interesting things in the Middle East. Also, he's a very brilliant man, a very tactical thinker. And today, he still has many things to say. And one of the things that I I think that it's most interesting is that he chose to write his doctoral thesis about 19th century diplomats. Hmm. And he could have written about anything uh, because his degree was in international affairs. There was no limit. It wasn't an historical thing. But he realized what people sometimes forget. And what they typically forget is that if you don't remember the past, you're condemned in the future. Hmm. And Henry Kissinger was a man who understood the past and its implications for the future. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about these interviews, because we talk about past companies, and then we talk about the current companies. And I want to go back to your path to become, you know, know, direct response marketing. And that goes back to, you know, when you grew up in New York, I want to find out where'd you grow up and what was life like when you were growing up? Who influenced you? Okay, well, I grew up in Queens. And um, I almost feel like I was one of the characters from Entourage. Um, not, not so much, but, you know, the neighborhood was middle class. Um, it was populated by Jewish people. It was populated by um, Irish. It was populated by Italian. It's just a very middle class area. Mm-hmm. People cared about their families. 
and almost as important as their families was food. Hmm. And food was just wonderful. Um, in terms of influence, um, I, I think that there are two types of influences that you have in your life. Yeah. And one you know in, you know from close and one you view from afar. Um, the ones close were my parents. Yeah. Um, I was an only child and my parents had a very strong influence on me and, and particularly um, seeing my parents both as entrepreneurs and mm. knowing that at that time uh, they were second generation entrepreneurs, they had a very strong influence on me. Yeah. And then from afar you had political leaders and you had people on both sides of the aisle from Republicans and Democrats. We lived in a different time. It, it was a period when Republicans and Democrats, while they were different with their political philosophies, they understood that ultimately they needed to make the right decisions for America. Today's politicians, and I know we're trending off subject, today's politicians um, are much more egocentric. Mm -hmm. and what's in it for me? And their parties uh, believe in something called game theory, which is basically if you win, I lose. If you lose, I win. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what happens is we all lose. Right. And so I looked at politicians at the time again, from both sides of the aisle, and we're just truly amazed by them. Um, so you had, as an example, Jacob Javits, who I, I went up to once and said, Mr. Javits, when you retire, I'd like your seat. And for that matter, um, you have William Proxmire, who is a Democrat from Wisconsin, and he was against the SST, the supersonic transport. And I loved what he had to stand for. And then you had politicians like Eugene McCarthy and others as well. Yeah. So t I wanted to hear about your parents. So your okay. parents are a big influence on you. What did they do? I know they were entrepreneurs. Well, my my father owned a printing company. The printing company was founded my, by my grandfather when he came over uh, from Poland in the early 1900, or 1900s. And it grew very nicely until the 1950s. And from the 1950s on, it, it had a difficult time period until 1963 when he died. And he left my father with a business of debts. Hmm. And my father worked really, really hard and turned it around and eventually, you know, built it into a very successful printing company. Yeah. Um, my mother worked there part time when I was very little, uh, doing the books. She was a CPA and ultimately left there and went to work for a TV production company. But they were both involved in business. Yeah. So what did the printing company print? What did it, uh, what was it? I guess doing at the time it printed catalogs it printed books for yeah. major publishers in New York yeah it it was um not a commercial printing company that would print like stationery or do things for the common person but the businesses and so they would work for the large ad agencies yeah. uh, producing brochures and things of that nature and um in 1982 my father was one of the first people to do an ESOP an employee stock ownership program hmm. so instead of selling the company to another printing company and getting a certain uh price for it he sold it to his employees wow. um his employees were non-union um multiple times unions tried to come in and make the company a union company but they lost, and, and they, quite frankly, and if I can tell this to your audience, they got their asses kicked. <laughs> they got their asses kicked principally because yeah. if you, and this is something that I've personally believed, that if you treat people who work, and I'm about to say for you, but it really is with you, right, right. there is this principal distinction there. If you treat the people that you work with with respect and, and with fair wages and with caring, yeah. um, you really get so much more for them. Yeah. What a good idea. So why do you think more companies don't do that, what he did? Because that's, it seems like a brilliant idea. They're already working there. They know the business they have. And then you give them stake in the company or have them buy it. Well, greed. No. Oh. No. Yeah. Michael Douglas said greed is good. <laughs> and as a capitalist and as a libertarian, um, I believe very strongly in the free enterprise system yeah. and in capitalism. Um, but at the same time, it has to be balanced. Yeah, yeah. And when you lose the balance and the only thing that's important to you is the almighty dollar, that's when you have problems. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn, Rick, from your mom and dad growing up around the business or just in general? 
So I, I, I think that there are probably a couple things. Yeah. One is I learned analness. Um, <laughs> analness may not be, you know, um, a, a personality trait that your listeners are interested in. Um, but paying attention to details is really, really yeah. important. And there's no too, there's no detail too small. Yeah. Does it mean that once you have a, a reasonably successful business, that you have to do it all yourself? Yeah. And eventually, as we as we'll talk about with my second company, I actually gave up control. I went from being a control freak to someone who believes that good enough is good enough as long as good enough is met with a certain service standard. Right. Um, so that's one of the things. And then I think the second thing that I realized was that you never give up um, because my father could have closed the shop. Yeah. He could have walked away from it. Yeah. People would have lost their jobs. And his, um, his vendors or people that he owed money, they would have gotten pennies. But that really wasn't you yeah. know, his character. And it's certainly not in my character. Yeah. And then the last thing is that um, while you need to have a strategic plan and think about the long term, um, numbers really can tell you about a business. And if you dissect numbers, and that's what I like about direct response marketing, it's, it's very much a combination of right and left brain. It allows you to be both creative, but it also allows you to say, listen, my opinions really don't matter if I like a package. If I like a headline, you know, if I like a product, it's great if I like it. But the reality is that the only thing that matters is what the, the market thinks. Right. And the market is going to tell you in terms of pure numbers. And if you look at the numbers, it's going to tell you a response rate. It's going to tell you an average order. It's going to tell you an, an acquisition cost, net profitability. It's going to give you a whole bunch of key metrics. That it's a ne- this is a new you know, 21st century term, key performance you know, index or right. metrics. Right. But, you know, if you look at your KPIs, you get a good sense of your business. Right, right. So, Rick, I could see, like, early on in your career, all things, you wanted to do government, you know, so and you went to Georgetown, grad school. What did you do? What was it, what did it look like after you graduated? Well, I'll, I'll take just a step back and mm-hmm. say that um, I had the opportunity to work at the State Department when I was in graduate school. Mm-hmm. And I had a graduate student uh, fellowship, and it was for nine months. And the, the prospect was to turn in a report at the end. And I finished in four months. And I gave it to the assistant secretary of state and said, here it is. And he took it and said, I'll read it. Um, and I said, would you please give me a recommendation when I finish? And he said, you just don't seem to understand. You, you know, when I finished grad school, you don't seem to understand. You're not done. You have to be here for the nine months because if you're not, we won't get your money next year. We won't get your fellowship renewed. And so, therefore, we'll keep you busy. And I wrote my master's thesis. At that point, I realized government was not for me. Mm. And what was for me was ultimately business. And Georgetown had a program in international business and economics. And I was enrolled in that uh, program, that concentration and it allowed me to get a job in a, in a consulting company that did operations and management consulting, uh, going out to small and medium-sized businesses, often of banks. It was later, that company was later acquired by Citicorp, and we did operations reviews. Hmm. And basically, I would go into businesses, and I would look at their finances, I'd look at their marketing, their personnel management, I'd look at their products, I'd look at their competition, we'd make recommendations. And it was really quite quite funny because here I was, it was 1980 and I was 24 years old and I was telling people who were 59, 60 years of age and who had operated a business for 25 or 30 years, here's what you need to do to make your business better right. and here's what you need to do in order to get a, an extended line of credit and it, it was, it, it's a very strange relationship. That is strange, yeah, that is strange. Yeah. And, and that, that job put me on the road too much. That job put me on the road four days a week, five, I'm sorry, four days a week, um, three weeks a month. And then the fourth week a month, I would write the reports. And it really wasn't sustainable. My wife and I wanted to have a family. And so I saw an ad for a direct response company uh, that was looking for an operations person. Mm-hmm. And I answered it. Mm-hmm. 
And that's how I got into the introduced into the wonderful world of direct response. It's uh, it's fitting that you're brought in, you know, the world of direct response with a direct response ad for you to uh, to answer, right? Yeah. Well, it was it was an it was an ad in something called a new, a, a, a real newspaper. You know, one that was <laughs> delivered on Sunday mornings right. um, to your house. Yeah. So what did you do there when you went to that company? Well, I started um, running their travel agency and also their telemarketing operations um, because it dealt with people and it dealt with technology and it dealt with being able to execute a, a business plan. Mm -hmm. And from there, I, I became really, really interested. Uh, the company originally was called American Leisure Industries. It changed its name to Encore Marketing International. Mm -hmm. And it sold travel clubs. And it sold prepaid legal and motor vehicle buying and pricing services. Yeah. And credit card registration. And it did it um, via bank card solicitations through direct mail. And I just thought, this is really interesting. You can send mail to strangers and they'll send you money. Right. And I said, if we can do that, that's what I want to do. What did you see at the time at Encore that was working well? Because you were there for like nine years or so, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And so I saw the benefit of affinity marketing. I saw the benefit of having Chase Manhattan Bank, which was a bank at the time. Now it's JC, JP Morgan uh, Chase and Bank of America and other banks, I saw how it opened the envelope, how it allowed people to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. And that if you could do that, you could get their attention. And if you could get their attention, you could tell a story. Yeah. And if you could tell a story, you could get a customer. Yeah, so what did you see, when you think back to those days, that was working so well that you were gonna use when one day you had your company? with direct mail or when it comes to answering the phones? Because you were also in telemarket. you know, you said the telemarketing. What was, um, what were you seeing that was working that you're like, I'm, I'm going to use this when I have my business? So if the affinity opens the door, then what it is is that it's the benefit, it's the story and it's the benefits that sell the customer. Mm -hmm. So the story in this particular case was, imagine you could travel anywhere in the world and you could travel at discount. And not only could you travel at discount and get 50% off your hotel stays, but you could also receive additional benefits. Right. And so telling the story, getting the benefits, offering a no risk or a very low risk opportunity, in this particular case, it was a free 30 days on charge to the credit card on file, uh, something that no longer can you do. But uh, what it does is it, it makes a very compelling proposition to the customer that if you can tell them a story, give them, you know, or, or show them very, very strong benefits associated with whatever product or service that you're selling, and then make them a no-lose no proposition, right. which is try it. If you like it, continue. If you don't, no risk. Don't worry about it. Right, yeah. And then so after Encore... What did you do? Was there uh, something that happened that made you decide to, to want to move on? Well, Encore had grown very, very nicely and was on track to go public in 1987 and would have made me a very wealthy person. Um, unfortunately, in 1987, you had a stock market crash. And that stock market crash derailed uh, some of our expansion plans. Mm. And so I saw another opportunity with a publishing company. This company is called Agora Publishing. Yeah. Um, and at that time, it was probably, oh, I don't know, the fifth or sixth largest consumer newsletter publisher, um, mostly investment newsletters, a travel newsletter, yeah. and some other related things. But it was a relatively small company. And when I joined the company, I was employee number 36. Hmm. Uh, now I understand the company is pushing 500. Well, how did you find out about Agora? Um, I answered an ad. Okay. And I wrote a compelling direct response letter, you know, telling them my story, my benefits that yeah. I could offer to them, and a, and a compelling proposition. Yeah. So what, what kind of things did you do at Agora? 
Well, I was group publisher of the investment newsletter group, and so I was er, er, initially responsible for six newsletters um, that all had personalities, and I understood the concept of personality-driven marketing. Mm -hmm. And um, we increased the number of newsletters, and we tried lots of different direct mail formats um, and other uh, direct response channels to acquire customers, and it worked like gangbusters. Yeah. And so ultimately, we had over a million subscribers. It allowed yeah. the company to grow into other areas, including health publishing. And um, the rest is history in terms of Agora, but it was an absolutely incredible place. And I had the opportunity to work with uh, fantastic uh, colleagues who worked very, very hard and were very, very dedicated and who came up with really, really interesting ideas, including the idea for the Bookalog, which we can mm. talk about later. Yeah. Uh, that was used for this uh, Plague of the Black Dead, um, the newsletter was Strategic Investment. But also to work with copywriters and designers who were just breaking into the business. Some were established and really, really good mm. and, and were very, very well known, um, but some were new. And some of the new ones were people like Peter Betchel and David Deutsch and, and people that you've interviewed. Yeah, yeah. So what was Agora like then? Now it's 500 employees. Then it was 36. What was it like when you went in the office? It was frenetic. It was great. People did everything. Um, there was no ego. Um, you just had a, you had a mission and you had to succeed. Yeah. And, and it was absolutely incredible. Yeah. And we'll talk about that, like that campaign you mentioned in a bit, but I want to find out. So what were some of the big lessons you learned at Agora while you were there? Well, I, I think that I basically honed um, my ability to spot good copy, to inspire and develop a good copy, to recognize in the, in the words of Mark Ford that you are less successful as a, as a copywriter and as a marketer if you tell people what to do you're better if you show them and so Mark and Bill as exceptionally strong copywriters um, showed me pushed me taught me how to be a good copywriter mm. yeah so you worked with a lot of top copywriters too um, who sticks out to you that you worked with as far on the copywriting front at the when you were at Agora? Yeah. So there, there are, are so many, um, and there are people like Dick Sanders and William Friedrich. Dick Sanders was the copywriter. William Friedrich was the designer. They were the originators of the Magalog as we know it today. Numerous people hold claim to that, but it was truly their idea, and working with them was, it was amazing. Yeah. But working with a new writer, and when I say new writer, it was in relative terms. I mean, he had experience... He just wasn't as well known as he is today. It's right. Peter Betchel. Yeah. Peter did an amazing amount of research. Not only did he do an amazing amount of research, he saw the the ultimate end product in his in his head. And so his comps, because at the time you didn't have computer aided design, um, so his comps, his layouts that he would hand write basically gave the designer all the tools that they needed in order to take what was in his mind. Yeah. It made him exceptionally effective. Yeah. What do you think separated, because obviously you've seen a lot of copywriters over the years, those top copywriters, what did you see differentiated them? What were they doing that, let's say, someone else who is not considered an A-list top copywriter, what were they doing? It's just pure genius. I mean, to be honest with you, why is, you know, A-Rod, A-Rod? You know, why is Michael Jordan from your hometown? Why is Michael Jordan Michael Jordan? You know, there are people who are just exceptional. Yeah. Now, in the case of Michael Jordan, he was born with a certain talent. Right. That talent was refined through hard work. Yeah. Um, but it is just an innate in it's an innate talent that just makes them incredible. And also the research and and just that quite frankly they think differently than everyone else. And um, you can write, if you think of headlines, you can think about a headline, you could come up with one. And what you'll find is that it's just, it becomes a cliche. It's the headline that you would expect. 
Mm -hmm. and not the headlines such as the five foods that you should never eat when you're on an airplane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you interviewed Brian Kurtz, and that was a headline that he had used for boardroom reports. Mm -hmm. And I think it was I think it was a Gary Benz of Anger or Gene Schwartz headline. I'm not sure whose it was, but it, it just who would think about five foods never to eat before you go on a plane? Right. I mean, you're selling it. You're selling a newsletter. Right. It's true. So I want to talk about that. Some of the campaigns you saw that w worked really well at Agora, and one of them you mentioned was the Plague of the Black Debt bookalog. So tell me about that campaign a little bit. Well, it, it came as a result of, of an off-site retreat at um, a bed and breakfast. And we had um, the two editors, um, Jim Davidson and Lord William Rees-Mogg there, along with some copywriters and the marketing manager and myself and Bill and, and Mark and someone to take some notes. And um, it you know, was something that was basically discussed in... Uh, Wally Weish, um, who is a marketing director who worked with me, who is responsible for the publication, referenced that he had seen something that really appealed to him. It was an interesting format. Yeah. And it was the format of the bookalog, and it was used by Covenant House. And it was taking something that was used in one venue, in, in one type of uh, requirement, which is fundraising. And... Um, Wally said, we need to do this, but for a newsletter. Hmm. And um, Lee Euler wrote it. Um, it utilized some existing copy, a lot of new copy. And it was amazing. And what was truly amazing about it was that it, it, changed, the f it, it changed the recipient's perception of what it was that they were, re they were reading. You could send them a, a long letter. A long letter was 24 pages in length. You could send them a faux newsletter, which was something that looked like a newsletter having investment stories. Yeah. Or you could send them something that was a book. And the perception of receiving in a six by nine envelope with very little hand with very little copy on the outside, and just a little letter inside that basically said, um, I came across this book, I think you should read it. It's really important, it's gonna impact your life. Hmm. Please read this book. It's important. It, it changed. It changed the conversation. Yeah. And um, when you got this book that basically was 116 pages in length, just a little paperback book. Um, when you looked at that book, um, you didn't look at it as a promotion. And instead of um, sidebars, you had chapters, and it read like a book, and it told you a story. Hmm. And all weave through the story was the solicitation, basically, for strategic investment. And it really just changed the whole dynamics. And we mailed something like seven or nine million pieces in seven or eight months. It wow. was incredible. Wow. And we tried it with other publications. I mean, we, we tried it with other newsletters uh, for our Taipan newsletter. We, once again, believing in big headlines, said, what went wrong with the 20th century? It was an amazing headline. It worked well, not as well as the plague of the Black Dead, but it worked <laughs> really, really well. Right. So, what do you do to roll that up? Because you know, you send seven to nine million pieces. That's expensive. Do you? What's the testing process look like? So you know to just keep rolling it out and out, and you're not spending all this money and you know. So it's interesting because you almost throw a testing process out the door based on results. So the, the typical strategy that I'll talk about for testing, not specific to the to Plague of the Black Dead or, or book logs, right. is that you have a, you commission a copywriter to write something. Um, you have a, an existing control, so you mail twenty five thousand of your existing control, five of your best list, five thousand pieces each, and so that's your control. And then you have a new copywriter or copywriters and you test that other copy against it. Mm -hmm. So you again mail 25,000 pieces, five lists, and you might you know, have a second headline as well. Yeah. So you basically have a three panel test and that's what you do. So you mail 25,000 and that's what we did in this particular case. It just went ballistic. Hmm. The response rates were just so strong 
that instead of following the normal progression, which is you mail 25,000, then you might mail 50,000, then you mail 100,000, then 200,000, and then 300,000, the progression was 25,000, 100,000, 250,000, 1 million, 1. 1.8 million. Wow. That's wild. Yeah. It was, uh, it was incredible. So was, this was selling a subscription service for the financial newsletter? That's correct, yes. yes. Wow. So what was the offer? Well, the offer basically was you can subscribe for one year at a certain price or yeah. for two years um, for a discounted price. And if you subscribe for two years at a discounted price, um, you get additional benefits. And you can um, receive any unused portion of your subscription feedback. Yeah. yeah. Refunds were negligible. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I can just think of the cost of postage on something like that is ridiculous. Well, I, I can tell you that postage was a lot less than it is today. Um, but postage was probably um, somewhere around 15 cents a piece. It, it was pretty right. inexpensive, but you're still at 1.8 million pieces times 15 cents writing a postage <laughs> check for a large number. Right, exactly. So what were the other campaigns that stick out? In the so, um, Agora days. Well, I mean, as I said, we tried a whole bunch of book logs. We did phone newsletters. We did other direct mail pieces. We did tabloid, tabloids. tabloids. I mean, we used every single format out there. Mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, if you're not testing, um, then you're really not doing your job. You know, a salesman's philosophy is ABC, always be closing. Mm -hmm. um, as a direct response marketer, the rule of thumb should be ABT, always be testing. Mm -hmm. Because you really don't know what it is. You don't know if it's the headline. You don't know if it's the, you know, the format and design. You don't know what you don't know. Right. So you always test. Yeah. So what's, Rick, can you think of one of those ones where you did test... Um, and you found out like, it wasn't working how you wanted, and then you changed something, and then it started working really well. What was what, an example of one of those? So I, I, I'm not sure, honestly, that I could answer that question to say that we took something that wasn't working well right. and really turned it around. Because usually what happens is that you see incremental improvements. Everything is incremental improvement. Right. This is true about direct response. It's true about life. Yeah. Um, and so if something is not performing well, um, it's probably not performing well because of what it is in mm. the message that you have. Yeah. And quite frankly, what you then do is you learn to kill it off. <laughs> you, you don't eat your children, yeah. but you do kill your products. Yeah. So what was the time you had to kill something off? There. Oh, there are many times. I mean, we're switching gears now from newsletter publishing to supplements. And I had always believed that, you know, I was this practical person. I was this person who was based on numbers. I was this person who would say, okay, the way what you do is you just look at something objectively and all that. And quite frankly, I fell in love with certain products and nutraceuticals that I liked. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was this product for Syndrome X. And as a doctor, I'm sure you're aware of Syndrome X. Syndrome X is also known as metabolic uh, disorder. And essentially what it is, is this, a series of attributes that taken together cause a series of problems. And they cause everything from heart disease to diabetes to fat stomachs to hypertension to a whole bunch of things. Yeah. And I came across a formulator who I had enormous respect for. I came across science that was incredible. Um, I, I said, this is, you know, a product that America needs. Right. People are going to line up knocking on my door for this. I was just so excited for this product because I just, I saw the potential. I, that's basically why I went into the business. I saw potential more than 20 years ago or about 20 years ago for uh, nutritional supplements to be sold through direct response right. um, without you know, strong doctor relationships, so not in the Philips Healthy Directions model, not in the model of um, Agora, but basically just telling a story about really good products because the market was going to be appropriate. 
that the demographics had shifted, that the demographics had shifted to a way where people who were at that time, you know, from 40 to 50 years old, they really were going to take control of their health. And they also had disposable income and they would buy these products. Right. And so I just figured, okay, here we are, we're in an industry where um, all these people need my product and it has great research behind it, mm -hmm. has an amazing story. We had a really interesting cover. And we, we what actually, it look like? Yeah. We had two different covers that I would have said, oh, these would resonate with everyone. So we had this fat, fat, super fat man who had the nicest face and the nicest smile. And where his different organs were, we pointed and we said hypertension, we said diabetes, we said all the different health conditions that this person would have. Right. We said heart disease, you know, we said, you know, hardening of the arteries. We showed this really great guy and with a good headline and people should have reacted and bought. They didn't. We did another one, which is we said America is turning into a, a, a Twinkie nation and we showed a, a, a pictures of two Twinkies and someone shoving them into their mouths and saying, do you want to do this to yourself? Again, we thought pure genius, we being me, I thought pure <laughs> genius. Um, no, not pure genius, kill that off. We had another product, Rejuverin. It was an anti-aging product. It was designed to basically, because of the way it was formulated, help various organs of your body. The concept of prevention, big mistake. People are not interested in prevention. They're interested in dealing with something that they already have. So if I, can, if I tell you, I can save you from trouble three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, you say, what are you going to do for me now? That's mm -hmm. what you're interested mm -hmm. in. We're more short-term oriented than long-term, and, and that's true of my business of supplements, and it's true of business in general, particularly publicly traded companies, and it's true of our life. Yeah. Rick, for the metabolic, I mean, how do you even know to kill it? Because let's say you have so many factors. You have the headline, you have the picture. You know, what if, you know, okay, this headline, let's try something else. Or let this picture, maybe it's the picture and the headline. And, you know, how do you know, but like, this is not working? 3%, 0.4%, 0.5%, an average order of $80 or $70, whatever it is, you have a KPI. You stack that KPI against something else that you're doing. It does 1%. It does better than 1%. It has an average order of $100. The conversion to continuity up front is much higher. So basically, you say, you know, Rick, you're not so smart after all. <laughs> I mean, at this point, you probably spent a lot of energy, time with the formulation and, you know, the copy and the, you know, so what does killing it off look like? Killing it off basically means that you just pay your expenses. You yeah. never mail it again. You let the inventory lapse. You yeah. try to sell the inventory right. at a deep discount. So basically, it becomes a cross-sell product, and it's normally thirty-nine ninety-five, but you can get it for nineteen ninety-five, half the price. Yeah, you know, and you do whatever you can to generate whatever you can in terms of income. But basically, um, as a piece, as a product that you're going to market, you just take it out of your uh, your routine, basically. Mm -hmm. your, in a regime of monthly mailings. Yeah. What did the, what was the anti-aging product? Um, what did it consist of? Yeah. Oh, it consisted of probably 10 different things and, and quite frankly, I don't remember, yeah. um, which was also just one of the other things in general that I learned, which is that it, at the time when I did a brain power product, um, people forgot to take it. So it meant that the product <laughs> That's another product that you had to, I had to kill off. I mean, quite frankly, you launch products, you have some that are basically consistent and others that are just marginal. And um, it seems cold and cruel to say what I'm about to suggest, but um, you have to sort of be calculating and say, okay, 
you know, the market is not interested in this, but yeah. they are interested in something else. Yeah. And make whatever that something else is as good as it can be in terms of formulation. Make your marketing for it as good as possible. Yeah. But it's it's really a very calculated decision, you know, that just simply says, you know, on an analytical basis, one does better than another and it's a better use of resources. Yeah. So how long would it take you, let's say, for the the metabolic syndrome product from when you know you're working with the formulators you're doing the research to actually having everything ready to mail the first promotion for it what is that time frame so i think you're looking generally at about a four to six month period of time it's yeah. also quite frankly dependent on the copywriter schedule yeah so um what you want to do is you want to stack the deck and so when you're launching a new product, you want to find the very best copywriter that you have yeah. um, in your arsenal or that you know of, and yeah. you want to approach them, you want to convince them that this is the greatest thing since sliced bread and that they should be writing this package. Right. Um, and sometimes it's a challenge to get them to write the package that you want them to write. Um, and then once you have them write the pack, once you get them to commit, it's their own you know, approach to... You know, what is, what's the story of the product and finding the unique selling proposition and being able to do it. And then, you know, it just becomes, you know, a two month process, which is done simultaneously for manufacturing, mm -hmm. getting everything else in line because you're going to need special reports that accompany this and anything else that you need to do, you need to train. But it, it's probably a four to six month period of time, again, depending on the ability of, um, the, the ability of the marketer to get the copywriter that they want. Yeah. I want to hear about the transition from Agora to your first nutritional company. Before I ask that, though, I have to hear about what you just said. Like, you have your first campaign, right? You just started your nutritional company. And what if you can't afford the best copywriter? What, what did you do for your first campaign out of the gate? So um, let's be clear. And that is that I went from a company... Um, Agora that could pay anyone anything basically right you know, where budget is not a consideration you you obviously as a as a manager responsible for the bottom line want to align the best writers with the the best fees that you can negotiate yeah and your fee is two part your fee is what I pay you today and then the other component is what I pay you in royalty tomorrow right and so you find the balance but you go from a company like Agora, like a Healthy Directions, you know, like a Boardroom Reports, you know, like many of these other companies that you've interviewed, and um, you've you've had the best, and now you don't have the budget like that. Right. Um, so really, what it is is you're 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 looking at finding decent writers, adding your own spin to it. You know, collect working with them in a collaborative way and keeping your fingers crossed. Right. That's where you know incremental improvement occurs. Yeah. So um, my first copywriter, and I won't name his, I won't name him. Um, and, un and unfortunately, he recently passed away. Mm. Wow. But he he wrote a, a promotion um, for one of my products. It was um, for something that we called inositol plus um, high amounts of this particular B vitamin as, as you are aware you know have a variety of beneficial effects it's been shown in clinical studies to deal with anxiety depression yeah. this was another very big market I mean again 20 years ago when we launched inositol plus um, Prozac wasn't as big as it is but it was still quite large and they didn't have the other range of SSRI the serotonin reuptake inhibitors you know, these drugs that make people happy. But the point was that large doses of inositol will, along with other B vitamins um, and magnesium. And so he wrote this package, and it was a marginal package. Marginal being that we lost money, but we didn't lose a boatload of money. Okay. And by tweaking the headlines, it got a little better. Yeah. And then, you know, a little more, and it got a little better. And, and that's really what you do until you start building a business. And even if you have a very successful business, you know, the, 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 the biggest results occur from the smallest little things. 
And that's why there's always be testing. So maybe it doesn't need to be in an envelope. Maybe it needs to be in a Magalog. Maybe it doesn't need to be in a Magalog because the price and postage changes, but it needs to be in a digest or it needs to be in a Slim Jim where you need to change the headline or the picture right. or the number of calls to action that you have throughout this uh, because people don't read from start to finish. Right. It's not Moby Dick. And so... Um, people basically pick up where they want to read and they read that piece. And if you need to convey the integrity behind whatever it is that you're selling and you need to be persuasive that they can try it at no risk and that they'll benefit. Yeah. And you, and you support that by giving testimonial copy. Yeah. And, you know, it's just interesting because... Like you said, you have these top, the top copywriters maybe in the world that you're working with at Agora, and then you need to find that medium of who you can afford and who's the best when you start your own company because you don't have uh, the same budget as Agora does. So I just wanted to hear your thought process. So that's when you don't look necessarily at what the world rates someone. You don't say, Clayton Makepeace, a fabulous writer. Um, but Clayton Makepeace, you, you don't say, I'm looking for him. Right. What you say is, I'm looking for someone who's a good writer right. and who has a demonstrated history and who has, in certain ways, as much to prove as you do. And so I identified a lot of early writers early in their careers, mm -hmm. people who used to work at Healthy Directions, people who used to work at Agora, and who became amazing copywriters. So Carleen, amazing copywriter, developed um, by Clayton Makepeace, worked with her, worked with Kim Krause, Allison Hancock, Susie Belteri, lots of people who became amazing writers. David Deutsch. Mm -hmm. you know, David was one of the first writers at Agora that we used. Peter Betchel, another early writer. So not early writers, but they needed to build a portfolio and they worked harder than anyone else. Yeah. And, if, and if you are blessed with a good brain in a creative sense and you work hard, you can do amazing things. Yeah. So, Rick, what made you decide to transition finally from Agora to your own company? Because I could see that being very scary. Well, it, it was very scary because I left a, a well-paying position, um, but it was an opportunity to embark on what I thought was a, a growing segment of a, of a market. Right. And that was the sale of nutraceuticals. I had seen what Healthy Direction had done. Um, I had seen what Agora was successful in, in building small new, you know, newsletters, yeah. beginning to sell supplements, um, but not as a principal, but as a joint venture. And said, so this is a unique opportunity and one that I would like to pursue. Yeah. But it was, it was very scary because my income was a fraction um, in the beginning of what it had been in the past. Right. And um, I still had a family. I had a wife. I had a son who was 10 at the time. And I had a daughter who was 7. Right. And um, it, was, it, was, it was very scary. And for a number of years, I'm, I made a fraction of what I had made previously. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I re, you know, realized a very nice return, which more than made up for the initial sacrifices. Right. But it, it was scary. Yeah. And that's and that's the role of any business owner. And someone who's starting a new business, someone that has an existing business, yeah. is the daily overheads that are associated with the business and what happens um if something doesn't go right. Yeah. You don't have it's not just you, it's employees, it's vendors. You know, there's all there's a different degree of pressure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see that being paralyzing for some people. You know, they have wife, kids, you know, starting. You know, how did you get over that scariness to just, I'm just going to do this? Well, I, I think that you, I, I think that it's, life is just a, a question of trade-offs. Yeah. And so you have things that are scary or that trouble you in working for a particular company yeah. and, you know, complaints that you might have. Um, and that's at one level, and you just trade them for something else. Right. But 
quite frankly, when you have your back against the wall, um, as, as I've done and as many entrepreneurs have done, um, that's often when some of the greatest work is, is exhibited. Right. And um, it was fun to be at the relatively early stages of an industry, a direct response supplement company. Yeah. Since you know, I first got into the business roughly 20 years ago, many companies have gotten into the business. Some of them have grown vastly larger than I am. Uh, some of them are smaller than, I, than I, I am. But they've all faced the same basic issues. Which are what? I'm sorry? What are the issues? Well, the issues are identifying products that markets want, yeah. um, identifying uh, quality uh, copywriters who can present it. Um, there is an increasing level of regulation um, of our industry. There is um, increasing costs that are always involved. Yeah. And there's the basic issue, what if even after all of that, the customer doesn't buy a second time? third time what do you do yeah and while there are minor tricks that you can use that are direct response tools that many marketers know um they're not something that you hang your hat on they're just the incremental benefit yeah you just have to have a good product and fairly price it and be there with outstanding customer support yeah and Rick, when you started Advanced nutri- you know, Nutritional Products, you had never started a nutritional company before. I could see how you found and you were able to identify some of the top copywriters out there. What was the process like on the formulation side of things and coming up with products? So I had a doctor partner who originally was responsible for uh, formulation. Mm-hmm. And he had a radio show in New York, which offered certain amounts of celebrity Hmm. Um, plus he also had a oh, couple nice. of books and um, as a result of that he um, stood behind the product so it was something it was a method of marketing that I understood from previous experience yeah. of using personalities and he was involved in the in the science part of it yeah um, I had some cursory understanding of the science although my educational background didn't provide for it my degree, my undergraduate degrees were double major in, in political science right. and, in, and in history. Political science isn't a science. <laughs> uh, but over the years, I've met a number of good formulators, and I have four doctors who work with me on product formulation today. And I have many industry contacts in raw materials who share with me double-blind, placebo-controlled studies of humans. So if you look at what the industry was 20 years ago, the standard for evaluating a product was much lower than it is today. Mm -hmm. And when people, and I I want to be very clear about this, and and while I'm not talking to a general audience, perhaps some of the people that are listening to your show today, they're um, buying nutritional supplements or they're thinking of nutritional supplements and they're thinking they're unregulated and they're not proven. they're, they're not regulated because of an exemption in the 1934 Food, Drug, Law, and Cosmetic Act. They're mm-hmm. considered food. So they're not um, directly submitted to the FDA for uh, regulatory efficacy and safety. Um, but there are high standards for that that are outlined under the JSHE, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act that was mm-hmm. passed in 1994. Yeah, yeah. So in the advanced nutritional product days, what were some of the most popular products that you came up with? So we had a product that was called Cardiocysteine that later, because of trademark issues, we changed to Cardio Support, but Cardio Support was one of them. Uh, a second one was Immunogord. It was a combination of colostrum and lactoferrin, and we told a very compelling story about why newborns aren't sick, um, and mm-hmm. it, was, um, it was quite interesting tying your um, immunity as an adult to the same immunity that you had as a child because as a child you were getting in utero um, colostrum and um, mm. some lactoferrin. Right, right, right. So that was that was the second one or a second one and we had um, a product that we launched right after Viagra 
launch okay. in 1996 uh, that was called V Power, and uh, V Power was an extremely successful male enhancement product. Okay. Um, it did not make the claims, and, and I've never made the claims that you know are um, borderline pornographic. We we don't talk about anything other than enhanced libido and greater endurance, um, but no physiological changes. Hmm. So what other products stick out to you uh, that are memorable in the uh, advanced nutritional product days? Well, I earlier mentioned about products that you know didn't work You're to kill off power you know type of product um what what i learned in general was the 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 true nature of the 80 20 rule that um we had a line of 24 SKUs, and when you looked at it you know 20 percent of the of right. the um 24 SKUs or roughly six products represented 80 or 90 percent of sales and that's what we focused on yeah so the cardio support, the Muno, and the V-Power? Yes, principally. And, and there were a few others. We had one um, which was an osteo support and, and, and a number of others. Um, the essence, by the way, and, and I, I, this isn't about nutritional product formulation, but it is about marketing, yeah. is that if you, in essence, sell formulas in the case of nutritional supplements, but just in general products, other products, that are very similar in nature to everything else in the market, you're mm -hmm. selling on the basis of price. Yeah. How cheap you can be, right. you can never win on the basis of price. And right. I had a conversation yesterday with the uh, chief marketing officer of Healthy Directions, and he said his objective right now is to wean people off of the concept of discount. Yeah. This discount hurts marketers. Yeah. It hurts customers and it hurts marketers. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that sticks out to me, Rick, when I'm reading my notes about you is I have a couple notes and saying, you know, at the time you are start, I mean, I don't want starting industry, but you're in the very early stages of an industry. Like now nutritional products seem obvious. Then we didn't have like whole foods and organic and health wasn't seen as it is now. So you're almost starting and, and I had a note that says new categories of products and you're starting new product positioning which is kind of what you're talking about. How do you, what were some of those examples of, you're almost starting new categories, right? And position these products. Right, so the average um, person doesn't know what they don't know. So if you tell them what they don't know and you, you, you say it in a way which is not insulting to say, you don't know this and you're stupid. Um, but if you present it as, by the way, this is an often overlooked cause of fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. um, then, um, and you know, it, you know, I I have this issue myself. Um, then the people relate, and, and so often some of the promotions, uh, particularly about the heart problem mm -hmm. promotions, yeah. um, relate to the fact that my father died of heart disease, my grandfather died of heart disease. Mm. Fortunately, I don't have that. And I take proactive measures, which include taking my products. Yeah. What were some of the big milestones in advanced nutritional products? So clearly the, the first big milestone is um, year one when you hit a million dollars in sales. Year two when you double it. Year three when you double that. Year four when you double that. Year five when you more than double it. And in year five, sell the business to a publicly traded company. <laughs> that about sums it up. Yeah. And, and, the, and the point is that along the way, because of the maturity of the market, things were a lot easier then. They were a lot tougher now. But the maturity of the market wasn't where it is today. Um, so our, um, our profitability was, was exceptionally high. Mm -hmm. And so without getting into... Um, purchase prices and things of that nature, mm -hmm. the terminal value or the valuation of the business was at a very nice multiple because the profit margins were exceptionally high. Right. So, I mean, that almost seems too easy. I know it wasn't super easy. What were some of the challenges during those times? The, the, the challenges are that um, we were running the business out of an office building using a conference room as a fulfillment area using 
Um, and a back office is a storage area. And one day the landlord decided to turn on the heat and messed up some of our products. Oh, wow. And so we lost $20,000 worth of products. Wow, it was, quite frankly, our stupidity because we didn't know about temperature control. Um, so, you know, there, there are things like that. And then there's one wonderful story that I love to tell, and I wish I could only tell this story once, but it's happened to me more than once, which is that you work on a promotion, you have it printed, everything is all set, you write a postage check, you have the trucks deliver the postage to the, the pieces to the um, post office with the check, and the post office loses your mail. Wow. And there you have a situation of being able to prove a negative. How do you know it wasn't delivered? You just had a rotten promotion and it got no response. Right. And you say, but I didn't get any response. It was a rotten promotion. So you just chalk up losing money. And I've lost money on multiple occasions because post offices have lost my mail. So you can't in the end prove anything? No. Now I have ways to track um, my mail better than existed 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago. But still, it's hard. Yeah. So what do you do? Just send it to a bunch of relatives and see if they receive yeah. it? Or? There, oh. Fortunately, there is a company. It's called U.S. Monitor. It's okay. an unpaid commercial for U.S. Monitor. But they have uh, seeds that you can use in different cities around the country. We have 25 cities around the country, East Coast, mid, you know, Midwest, and um, West Coast and Alaska and Hawaii. And we know when we mail and when it's received in the con condition. <coughs> yeah. Percent, excuse me, the percentage of mail that's received. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, I have an aunt in this state. I have a cousin in this state. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, fortun fortunately, there are businesses okay. who have grown up and who are supporting um, marketers like myself. Right. Enrique, I can expect too, with that amount of growth, what were some of the growing pains that you saw? Because that's a tremendous amount of growth in a short period of time. So growing pains are, are finding staff, finding staff that, um, is, that can be trained to understand the products that you're selling. Often they're young and they don't see a need for these products. Um, then you have basic issues also of, quite frankly, of cash flow. So even though you are um, profitable in the long term and at the end of the year you can report profitability at any point in time you can have a cash flow price crisis because you have to pay the post office right and if you're mailing more and more pieces um, you have to pay the post office more and more money so what starts out at six thousand dollars is now twelve which is now twenty five which is now fifty right. which is now a hundred or a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a month in postage you know which seem like big numbers of, you know, dollars to larger companies are just, you know, pocket change. Um, I wrote a postage, I was, I requested a postage check. It's a better word. I requested a postage check for over a million dollars once, wow. not for my company, you know, but for another company that I work for. So in relative terms, but for still small companies, you have to come up with the cash. Cash flow is king. Cash yeah. is in all in all businesses so at the time how do you solve those problems when you're going so quickly because that's i mean you're if you're doubling it's really hard for staff purposes to keep up and plus you have to buy all the product to supply people you know it's not right. like a like but you but you have terms so you're if you if you are lucky and have vendors who work with you and understand you um, you have 60-day terms, and 60-day terms help a lot. Yeah. Um, so you have cash requirements on certain key things. Um, and so you, what you're ultimately trying to do is to balance your fixed overheads, which are your staff and whatever other modest fixed overheads that you have. So personnel expense, yeah. you know, related expense. Also, another I pretty much... Um, fixed expenses, you know you're going to get a big phone bill each and every month. Um, but um, the, the, the real thing is balancing the fixed expenses with the, the timing and the cash flow of being able to 
you know, do the mailings and knowing when the response is going to come and making sure that you have enough money for payroll and often not paying yourself or paying certain other people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just basically, you know, cutting them in for, you know, a higher return when things went right. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge, a large volume of calls too. How do you handle all of the, the incoming inquiries? Well, you, I mean, technically you have an ACD phone system, which is an automatic call distributor. And because of my prior background, understanding telemarketing companies, right. I understood the technology. And um, so you just hire lots and lots of people to answer the phones and um, you anticipate the growth and the demand of number of phone calls. Yeah. And you know that 60% of your orders are going to come by phone and 30% of the orders are going to come by mail and ultimately 5 or 10% are going to come by online sources and you plan accordingly. And you look at reports that come off of your ACD phone system. Rick, how do you know, how would a company know whether to, okay, I'm going to do this in-house because I can train them and as opposed to hiring a, like a telemarketing company to, to do this for you? So that's a, that's a wonderful segue and it's a perfect question. Thank you for the question, Jeremy. Um, so after I sold advanced nutritional products where everything was done internally with the exception of printing and manufacturing. I'm surprised um, you have all your hair, you know, yeah, with <laughs> hair. It's good gene. <laughs> right. Um, and, and only some of it is gray, <laughs> but, um, in any case, um, so what I learned by selling my company and it gets back to an earlier question relating to transition yeah. was recognizing that the Popowitz approach isn't the only approach to doing something and that with minimal, you know, that with the adherence to certain service standards, you can build a business, you know, relying on third parties. And so when I sold my company to Gold Shield, we had a staff that was in um, both Maine and Florida. We had a staff in Mumbai, India that I traveled to. Wow. And I learned to rely on others. So when Biocentric Health was formed, my current company, and it was formed roughly 10 years ago, um, it was formed as a total, totally virtual company with one and a half employees. And with fabulous um, friends, and I, I hate to call them vendors because it demeans the quality of the relationship and the right. importance of the work that they do, but where I have you know, list brokers who are amazing and who give me strategic intelligence about the marketplace and who give me good advice about good lists. And I have a, an amazing printer and I have an incredible uh, printer who gives me ideas on how to save money on printing and on postage. Yeah. And I have an amazing company that provides uh, pick packing and shipping and warehousing and customer service. And it's the recognition that it's not done your way, but it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. I want to get into the next company, Biocentric Health, but I can't not ask a question about Gold Shield because someone who's thinking about selling their company, what thing, what things should people pay attention to when they're selling their company? So um, one thing is, you know, why are you selling the company? Yeah. To understand the real reason. And so, you know, for me, there were, there were a couple of principal reasons. One reason was that it would provide a liquidity event to investors that had invested in my company. Mm -hmm. And um, that was very important to me, that if you treat your investors well, they will treat you well. Yeah. And it provided a liquidity event. Um, it was also time for me to... Um, be a part of a larger company which had pros and cons at the time mm. um, because I had the opportunity to run three businesses um, instead of one and more of a professional challenge with more people and more responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all the good things and you know another factor which would go into um, a decision to sell a company would be um, if you're going to stay with a company, as I was required to stay, because in essence, um, my investors got their payout, I got some money, but I had a personal service contract. Right. And the personal service contract was the condition for selling the company. Hmm. So it became the, the function to have good chemistry with the chairman and CEO of the company. Right. So I did in the beginning um, and didn't in the end. Right. I feel like I've heard that story Time and time again, the person you're just itching to start your own thing again. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'll, you know, when you get antsy, when, when the opportunity to be your boss, you know, can, your <laughs> boss can be, can occur and you can say, well, you know, I could do, I could work at 12 o'clock at midnight or I could work at 10 in the morning, you know, and I could work whenever I want and not have to meet someone else's, right. someone else's expectations. That's great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was very fortunate that I had a group of investors who um, knew me and who were willing to bankroll my existing business. Mm -hmm. And then the transition. What I mean, again, like this is common. They obviously want the when they buy the company, they want someone to stay on. Um, what should people pay attention to with the transition of like, how was the transition when you went from your business to working with you know, Gold Shield? So it was probably best characterized by Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And um, so in the beginning, I could do no wrong. And in the end, I could do no right. And the mm -hmm. truth was somewhere in between. Right. Yeah. So in other words, um, someone should maybe, looking at your situation at that time, negotiate to have as little transition as possible? Would that be? It, I... I I um, had a two-year contract. Yeah. Um, I stayed for almost three years. Mm -hmm. um, for the first year and a half, it was fine. Yeah. For a longer period of time, I believe certain promises and representations um, that didn't materialize, and so um, I made other plans. Yeah. So I want to talk about biocentric health. You know, Biocentric Health is the current company. And first of all, what made you start another nutritional company as opposed to sitting on the beach? Um, well, I was would be too young. I would have been 49 years old. And I don't play golf and I don't play tennis, although I have tennis elbow. I need your professional <laughs> help with that. But... Um, I, I don't play, you know, I, I don't play tennis elbow and um, in, in Yiddish there's a word, it's called spilkies in the Genecta Gazoites. It was made, a phrase made famous by Mike Myers um, and loosely translated is nervous energy throughout the body. <laughs> and so I, I, I couldn't sit still, I'd mm. have to do something. So if God gives me many years of life. I will work every day of my life. Mm -hmm. It won't mean that I will go to the go to an office, but my ultimate hope is that um, I can identify other smart young entrepreneurs and work with them to develop their dreams. Yeah, um, because I have someone who helped develop my dream. Yeah, and it put confidence in me and support in me. I've actually had multiple people like that, and that just is a remarkable thing. Yeah. Now, Rick, I mean, at this point, then you've started a successful uh, nutritional company and now you're starting another one. What were some things that you were going to do different this time around? No staff. Uh, just have one person who I have total faith and trust in. Um, and not that I didn't have faith and trust in, in any large number of people, but um, I... Um, didn't want the burdens and the responsibilities and uh, the fears of what would happen if. Um, and so that this was an opportunity to create a business um, utilizing um, resources that were on the market commercially that could do a good job. Yeah. That I could do what I like best. And what I like best is being a cross between a marketer and a geek. And so I like rolling up my sleeves and, and writing uh, copy to customers to generate incremental orders. I'm not that good enough. I'm a hack copywriter, um, but I'm a really good bean counter. And I'm good at looking at numbers and, and seeing numbers multidimensionally and figuring out the next steps and mm -hmm. building a business from that. It, building a business is like playing a game of chess you know, thinking 10 steps ahead. And, you know, this company gave me the benefits of, of that, which is to think strategically, to think creatively, to think um, as a bean counter. 
and apply that skill set to building a business. Yeah. I've been very lucky. Yeah. So no staff. What else? What else did you do differently this time around? Um, no staff. I, I still believe that you never sold on the basis of price, that you um, weren't the most expensive in the market to be the most expensive, um, that you provided value to the customer, but that you didn't sell on the basis of price, that yeah. you sold on the basis of un uniqueness, and that you provided extraordinary customer service, that the customer was always right. Yeah. That you want to treat the customer like you want to be treated. I know that it sounds like empty words, but it's really true. Yeah. I mean, and when you talk about uniqueness, when you were in the, you know, when you started your first company, you said there wasn't tons of competition like there is now. How did you differentiate this time around? Well, I differentiated by having unique formulas or unique ingredients and products. So as an example, um, joint pain is a, is a massive category for nutritional supplements. Yeah. Um, but if you sell the same ingredients that everyone else sells, yeah. um, then you really don't have anything. So fortunately, we were able to identify uh, for our leading product, um, and it is the company's leading product, um, two really innovative ingredients um, and not only were they innovative in terms of what the promise that they held, but they had a wonderful story. Mm. And the story was that as a botanical, uh, you can process the botanical using a chemical solvent to extract the active ingredient, and then you can use heat to dry it. Or you could do the second approach. And the second approach was to use freeze drying instead of heat and you could use water processing instead of chemical solvents to isolate the active ingredients. So if you do that, you have a better product for the consumer. Yeah. For an amazing story to tell. Yeah. And so as an example, I could also tell you that in this particular case, we use something called hyaluronic acid, which um, helps with synovial fluid. It keeps your joints moving around. It's mm -hmm. like having oil in your engine. Yeah. Without it, your engine doesn't work. Yeah. With synovial fluid, your joints don't work. Yeah. Well, most synovial fluid comes from rooster comb. Ours comes from biofermented potatoes. Hmm. An amazing story. Rooster comb, low purity levels, 8 to 30 percent. Um, and the weight of the molecule measured, measured in Dalton's is too big to be absorbed. Um, ours, um, purity levels of almost pharmaceutical quality of about 98 percent, 99 percent. Wow. We have them on uh, certificates of analysis in the right size, the right molecular size to be absorbed. Yeah. So you you look for still very, very big markets that can be con very competitive, but yeah. you just introduce uniqueness in your product. Right, right. I mean, how do you even find that out? That seems, I mean, it's an amazing story that this molecule, obviously low pur purity, you can't absorb it, and this one you can I mean, you probably don't even need to put that ingredient. You, for some reason, for one, chose that ingredient to put in the supplement. And two, you found out this, the proper way to deliver it. Yes. So, and, and also, I'm paying a lot more money. But yeah. um, my cost of goods um, might be higher than someone else's cost of goods. Um, but if I was just interested in selling the lowest price, cheapest stuff out in the marketplace, I would sell what everyone else does. Yeah. And so um, I was lucky to develop over the last 20 years a network of really good researchers and product yeah. formulators and ingredient companies that give me ideas, yeah. doctors who can help evaluate those ideas because I make no claims about being a genius about this stuff. I know more than the average person, but still not enough. Yeah. And I asked myself, would I take it based on what I've read yeah. um, if I had that problem? And um, I was just very, very fortunate. And um, so once someone told me all these things, it was like, oh, this is a natural. Yeah. And so look for big markets and uniqueness. Yeah. I mean, much easier to sell, even though the market is, is much more competitive. Um, uniqueness in a story will win out. Yeah. And Rick, um, you know, I want to get into biocentric health and I just realized that we're past the hour for you. So um, I don't know if you want to, we can pause here and 
pick it up some other time or what you would like to do? Well, how about if we go for about another 10 or 15 minutes? Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. I don't want you to freeze your butt off in there. You know? <laughs> um, so you should tell them the truth. And that is that I have a short sleeve shirt on and the air conditioning in my office building is working extremely right. well. That's what I mean. You freeze your butt off. You know, I'm on the opposite. I have a light shining in front of me. I'm I like I'm sweating. So we have the opposite scenarios. here. Yes. One other thing to say, and that is that I'm freezing my butt off because I just lost 30 pounds. And nice. uh, so I practice what I, what I preach, which is that you can actively control your health yeah. um, and you just have to take personal responsibility. So I was never fat. I was 208 on a six foot one inch frame almost and I'm now um, roughly 178, wow. 179 pounds. That's great. And um, you can do it. You so, don't need to do it. Yeah. So actually, I thought you were going to say, so now which product should people take to do that? <laughs> no. I've never sold a weight loss product. Yeah. Um, I take that back. I have for Gold Shield, yeah. uh, which was one of the issues that I had. But um, weight loss products generally don't work. Magic bullets of right. products don't work. Yeah. Things that people think you know, are their nirvana solution to something, regardless of the field of product that they sell, they don't, they're not going to solve the person's issue. Yeah. So give the person instruction on how to fish and let them therefore be fed for a lifetime. Yeah. Don't give them a false hope of here's a fish for today. Right. So for Biocentric, what are some of your favorite products that have worked well and maybe even the second time around, what are some you had to kill off? Okay. So um, I've told you about one of my products, my joint pain product, yeah. which is called Hydroflexin. Yeah. Uh, the second product, um, which, we which we launched for the company, was a product that we called um, Androx. And I had the fortune of working with Jim Punkery. And Jim is one of the best copywriters in the country. And Jim came up with a position which was totally unique and special. Yeah. And um, he changed the conversation. And it resulted in really amazing results for us. Um, a third product is a product called Alexin. Mm -hmm. Alexin is a homeopathic product that is also a nano drug. Um, as a homeopathic product, we're able to make uh, certain health claims that are precluded by um, the Shea. Um, you can't say certain things that, you know, state that the product would cure or right. a disease or illness. There's for homeopathics a certain exemption. So we had additional benefit. Um, the scientist who discovered it was absolutely incredible. Actually, I uh, uh, went to medical school at the University of Chicago uh, many years ago. Uh, so for your hometown, right. yippee. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And um, it was a nano drug in that he um, super miniaturized the size of the molecule. Hmm. And so because it was a homeopathic, it was delivered in, in um, a liquid form. Um, because it was a nano drug, it was super potent, a billion times um, the potency of anything out there wow. for a molecule you know, of its size, a billion times stronger than anything else out there. And there were no, there's no level of toxicity. So really, you could, wow. drink, you could drink the bottle and, you know, aside from probably having a stomach ache, that'd probably be the worst thing that happens to you. What does Alexin do? So Alexin enhances your energy. Hmm. Um, it enhances your immune system. Um, the doctor behind it is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Floyd Taub. And Floyd um, determined in, in his research, he used to be a director of an office at NIH in Bethesda. And um, he determined that if you manage your immune system, that your immune system has more to do than just with getting a cold. Yeah. It actually has to do with, among other things, because of cytokines. And this isn't a scientific conversation. Right. I want to use multisyllabic words. But cytokines, <laughs> manage your cytokines, you can manage your energy. Mm -hmm. So if you're suffering from low energy, if you've been diagnosed with chronic fatigue, if you have other issues, um, Alexin will really help you. Yeah. I'm just thinking, I'm smiling because as you say that, Rick, I'm thinking instead of, you know, with the Alexa, you're like, oh, you could just drink the whole bottle and you're fine. You probably just have like 
an obscene amount of energy. So you should slap like 10 hour energy instead of four, you know, five hour energy on there. And then there you go. So, you know, the thing is, and, and that's an interesting story. So you have a, an amazing company with five hour energy right. with hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in sales right. and distributed everywhere. And it's a brand that everyone knows. Right. No one knows Alexa. Right. And the thing is that it is an amazingly successful product for which I have amazing respect for right. um, on a commercial basis. However, it's a Band-Aid. And my personal position is that I'm not interested in Band-Aids mm -hmm. um, because Band-Aids um, don't work in the long term. They don't change your health status. And for me, it really is about health status. Um, my parents died at a young age and I decided that I wasn't going to die from like they did. Yeah. I wasn't going to die from cancer. I wasn't going to die from heart disease. Um, I was going to do things proactively. Right. Not that my parents were stupid or they didn't do any, they didn't listen to people, but that, you know, the science at the time wasn't sure. as sophisticated as it is today. Yeah. So I made it a personal mission to change the health outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Because people would see it as like a one time use as opposed to like an actual lifestyle change. Right. And 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 that's the same thing about losing weight. So people say, I went on a diet and I lost 30 pounds and you say, congratulations. And then you see them six months later and they now weigh 40 pounds more right. because they went on a yo-yo diet. They lost weight and then they gained it back. Yeah. Um, they changed their, they changed something for a short period of time that allowed them to achieve a certain objective and they didn't change the long term. Yeah. And my business is about the long term. My view about the life is about life is about the long term. Yeah. If you are short sighted, uh, you win, but you lose in the end. Right. I'd rather win in the end. And Rick, you bring up. I want to go back to your Jim Punkry comment. You said he changed the conversation. What did he do? How did he change the conversation? So um, in the past, it it pure it said that um, it's that you have a problem, it's your fault, um, you don't have the libido, you don't have the stamina, you can't perform, it's your fault. Jeremy, you're just disappointed. <laughs> Which... And what he did is he said, no, Jeremy, it's not your fault. Now, yeah. you're, you're I like hearing guy. that more, right? Yeah, you're, that sounds better. Jeremy, it's not your fault, you're a young guy, you're a, a, you're a stud, I'm sure, you know, I, I, we, we follow that line of, of conversation. Right. But the point is that the way Jim changed the conversation was that he gave it a term. Mm -hmm. The term technically is called um, andro, um, andropause. Mm -hmm. And he created, he made it well-known andropause. Mm -hmm. And he did a riff on it called manopause. Right. And we did a variety of different subjects about it. I mean, and, and some of the headlines, and you and I have talked about them, you know, which is, you know, does Mother, does Mother Nature want you dead at age 60? You know, and dead wasn't referring to being buried six feet underground, but just not performing like a man. Right, right. And that if you read this, you'll find out that it's not your fault and that there is hope for you. Yeah. And that it is natural for your levels of testosterone to decrease. And there are a variety of interesting things that you can do to make your testosterone increase along with other things. Yeah. And that's how we changed the conversation. Yeah. And that's what made, you know, that was what changed the conversation from a content point of view. And then you have a comfort, you have a, a, a conversation changer when you have a format change. Yeah. And no one is used to looking at a book, a paperback book. And, you know, people wanted this. They valued the book. You can't throw, you can throw away, you know, a six by nine envelope or a maglog. You might even call it junk mail. But a book, it's almost as if, you know, it's, it's anti-religious right. to throw away a book. Right. You can't throw you it away. You give it away, but you don't throw it away. I mean, you put it on your bookshelf, worse comes to worse. Right. You know, you don't, you never read it, but you don't throw it away. Right. And it, it was amazing. And it was a conversation changer. And, and I think I mentioned this to you in an earlier conversation that um, people would give it to their friends. Yeah. And they, they would read it. They would subscribe. They would give it to their friends. 
but they didn't have a, re a response device. Mm. So then in the back of the book, at the suggestion of our marketing director, um, really, really smart, we started adding um, involvement devices, you know, where you could basically turn up, you know, rip off the last page. Mm. And that would be an order form. Got it. And then we got even, he got even smarter. He decided we'll make the first one A, the second one B, the third one C, and we'll see what the pass around rate is. Mm. And there was a pass around rate. It totally changed the nature mm. of marketing. Yeah. Really interesting. One thing that catches my eye when I go to your site, which I find very interesting, one, it's a really unique naming. You have really unique names, like Alexin and and um and also the the labeling and the color and what it looks like what's your the thought process that goes behind some of the names and then the actual packaging what it looks like so i'm going to start with the company name yeah. which is biocentric health yeah and so the concept of biocentric health is it's it's about your health centric is about you bio is your biology health is about your health it's about your health um, with regard to product naming, we try to follow um, the approach of pharmaceutical companies, yeah. which is to give it a scientific sounding name. Um, in the beginning, um, we had products which were advanced joint care. Right. And, you know. Cardio support. Yeah. Cardio support, exactly. And, and there's a really good and legitimate discussion. I was about to use the word argument, but it really isn't for argument. It's for discussion. Right. There's a really good um, discussion to be held on product naming. And to look at product naming and say, you want something to be immediately recognizable. Right. So if I tell you advanced eye solution, you know, what you know is it's more sophisticated, it's for your eyes, and it's going to fix something. Right. You, you get it. Right. Now I make up a name like Restasis, and I hope that doesn't get me into copyright trouble. You know, it's it's copyrighted and trademarked by somebody. I don't remember their name. Maybe it's Alara Labs. I, I don't know. But Mr. Alara, I don't want to have any problems with you. I sound like Jackie Mason. <laughs> I don't want to be Jackie Mason. But the, the point is that what, is a, what does a Restasis mean? Right. I mean, maybe you could say your retina you know, um, Alexin, what does it mean? It really doesn't mean yeah. anything. You know, Androx sort of relates to andropause yeah. hydroflexin. You know, that's our joint pain product. Yeah. What we wanted to do was to enhance the synovial fluid. The vast majority of synovial mm -hmm. fluid is made up of water. So that's the hydra. And then the flexin. The flexin came from we're going to make you more flexible. So, you know, the concept is to try to take something that's pharmaceutical mm -hmm. to in some way um, make it sound scientific, in some way to be descriptive of what it is and what it does. Because it's interesting. You almost take the opposite approach from the other one. I mean, you had the cardio support and now you have Florox. You know, like, mm -hmm. so what made you switch to more of the pharmaceutical names? Well, we've we just experiment. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to work. And quite frankly, one of the things that I've not done in my testing and shame on me for this is I haven't had a product manufactured with two different labels on it. Hmm. We call one, never get the flu again <laughs> and the other Florox. I want to see that. I want you to do that. Well, that would actually violate the FDA oh. and FTC rules and regulations and, um, my FDA FTC attorney would not be happy with me, and, and he's a smart man. You and can't I sell the same product with a different name, or what? What's the no? You, you couldn't. You couldn't say something which says "never get fruit." Never. Oh no, I don't mean. I don't mean that. Yeah, I just mean two different. Uh, yeah. two different no, names. I mean, I think that you you can do it. There there are many examples. Companies typically, you know, might have a commercial line that they sell direct to consumer and then a professional line that they sell via doctor channel. Right, right. And they're the same product and they have a slightly different name. Yeah. Yeah. So what about the labeling? What about it? I'm just curious of how you come up with the colors, if there's like a thought process behind it. Yeah. You know, it again, it looks very medical. Yeah, exactly. Um, that was what we did in, the, in our first company. That's what we did in, in this company. Um, I, I never intended 
um, biocentric health to be on a retail shelf. So if you went into a GNC, if you went into Rite Aid, CVS, if you went to Costco, you look, they have really pretty labels. Mm -hmm. You know, pretty is, is, is something, you know, for the person to judge, but mm -hmm. they have pretty looking labels. And, you know, their labels are designed to catch your attention because there's only so much stocking space that's available. And it's got to catch your attention. Yeah. You have five different probiotics in front of you. What do you choose? Okay. Well, you're going you're gonna to choose something that catches your eye. Right. And you're going to pick it up. Maybe you're going to read it. You're going to look at what it has. And you're going to decide on the basis of price. And you're going to put it in your cart and you're going to buy yeah. So pretty is really important um, because I'm not interested in being pretty. Yeah. Um, one might argue that mine are ugly. I don't know. But um, mine just simply say we don't really give a crap about how the label looks. Um, really what we care about and ultimately what you should care about is what's inside of it. Mm -hmm. So – you know, again, it's the conversation of steak and, you know, steak and sizzle. And it's a, a legitimate conversation to have. Yeah. I have enormous regard for the retail brands that have been incredibly successful. Because they've done something that I just, quite frankly, don't understand. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they have, they, they have their objective, which is, you know, pretty much you have 10 seconds or 8 seconds or 6 seconds or 4 nanoseconds in the store with five things right next to you and you have to make a quick choice and that was you know that's not the choice i'm making you yeah. so rick what are some of the milestones of biocentric so the milestones are pretty much the same of, of growing you know a business consistently um i really love the concept of walking into an empty room <laughs> and starting something Right. Um, I, I think that it's from my entrepreneurial rate roots. It's something that my son is now uh, following in, mm -hmm. um, in his own way. Um, but I, I like creating something. Yeah. And um, so a milestone is, you know, the first year we did 1.3 million and we kept growing it from there. Um, when we were in business long enough and the first time we hit Inc. Magazine, um, we were incredibly um, glorified by that. Yeah. Um, what I was also really, what I'm really proud of is the fact that we did this with one and a half employees. Now, it doesn't mean that we did it by ourselves. It's not that Kenny Saltzman, the guy who works with me, yeah. and myself, we're biocentric. In a sense, we are. But the biocentric is our telemarketers in Auburn, Maine. Biocentric is the fulfillment company that we use in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Right. Biocentric is the manufacturers and the raw material suppliers that we use and the doctors that we use and the web people that we use. Yeah. You know, so, you know, basically um, what it did was it allowed me to um, realize a dream without the responsibilities of a full infrastructure. Right. I just found that fascinating. And more and more people today, more and more entrepreneurs are going that way. I mean, you know, there's something to be said for building the company of 10,000 people. There's something to be said for that company that, um, like mine, we're, we're not a, a huge company by any means. Um, but, you know, we're responsible for paying the salaries through the, the our partners in business, I was about to say vendors, but partners in business is better for probably hundreds of people. Yeah. And that's great. So when you look back, Rick, what has been one of the, mo one of the proudest moments? So the proudest moments have nothing to do with anything professional. Yeah. You know, the proudest moments are who you are as a person and what you stand for and what you live. And so, you know, because this is, we won't get into anything personal here, but no, you can, that's fine. But, but this is, this is, a, this is about business. You know, this is about business. Yeah. So what you do is you say, what are you, what's the code that you want to live your personal life and how that can be put into your professional life. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a disconnect. Right. You know, all too often, 
we segregate and segment our life yeah. into two things. And, you know, I have a standard and I can do anything over here. And then over here, I can't do any of that stuff. I want to be one person. You know, I, I, I don't want to be schizophrenic. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, I, I used to have a product that worked for schizophrenics, but anyhow. <laughs> I mean, it could be personal. What, well, what's a personal proud moment? You know, a, a personal proud moment is seeing, you know, our two children who grew up in our house and, you know, to see them, and I think you're a young father, yeah. um, to see, you know, to see your offspring you know, grow up and be respected. And, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, you go through these challenges of life, you know, with your family. And you think, oh, you know, why, how could they do this? They should know better. They grew up, you know. <laughs> my wife and I, you know, we try to set these examples. Right. And then you grow up. You know, they grow up. And you grow up, too. And um, you see that the world thinks that they're pretty good. They're decent people. Yeah. And, you know, I have a son who's doing really nicely professional, but more important, he's a, he's a mensch, he's a really good person. Right. And there's not the equivalent word in Yiddish, as far as I know, maybe you do, for, you know, a female. Right. But um, our daughter, she's a teacher. Yeah. And so our son has gone off into the world to try to, you know, do certain things in the music and entertainment industry and, and, so, and to take care of his family well. Yeah. And he's doing nicely in that regard. And our daughter is, is idealistic. And, you know, she's teaching children. And, you know, she's making a contribution. And our daughter-in-law, she's teaching children and making an amazing contribution. And I now have three children. And that's the proudest thing that I have. Right. And my wife. I, I mean, I, I told you this. I've been married for thir almost 34 years and with her for 36 and the fact that she puts up with me, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and a lot of the times it's, you know, I'm, re you know, because I used to say that I'm a perfectionist, but now I'm just in search of excellence, but really I'm just anal. I just want everything to be right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I ask that because, you know, personally, you know, when you have kids, they see you, how you conduct yourself in the professional setting and they've seen the evolution of your businesses and and also how you bring them up so i think it's important to you know talk about those personal proud moments too well thank yeah. you I, yeah. I appreciate that opportunity i, yeah. I want to just say one thing and it relates to how you and i first uh connected yeah um and that was that um someone that we both know you know told you about me and you reached out to me yeah um, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that, and I'm very appreciative of her. And, you know, I told you one story about my early time at Agora, which I won't go into, but I will tell you something else. And, you know, it's something that my children saw yeah. and it's something that I've used all through life. And it also goes back to our conversation about employees. So you pay employees, and hopefully you pay them a decent wage, um, and they take that decent wage and they, you know, they use it to live. Um, and that's perfectly normal. And then for certain people, you offer them bonuses. And bonuses are often characterized in monetary terms. Right, right. You say, if you do X, Y, and Z, or if whatever, you know, metric has been evaluated um, performs, I'll give you X amount of money. But really, money is something that, you know, comes, in, it's very ephemeral. It comes and it goes. And you don't have any recollection. And this one person, she was British, and she loved literature, and British literature, and a British literary magazine. And so as part of her bonus, which was a non, there were two parts of people's bonuses. There was a financial bonus, mm -hmm. and people expected that. I won't say expected it, but appreciated it, understood it, etc. Right. But what was, what was more important? I mean, hopefully for your audience, maybe they'll adapt this, is to find out who Jeremy is, mm -hmm. who Rick is, and who Sally is, and the other people who work with them. Find out what's interesting to them, what their hobbies are, yeah. and say, you know what? You like fishing. You have, the, you have the, your eye on this fishing reel, and it's a bunch of money, and you can't rationalize it. 
you achieve a certain thing, yeah. I'm going to get you that fishing reel. Right. I'm going to get you this literary magazine. And by doing that, um, someone, if they go fishing or if they go to their bookcase or someone comes into the room and goes, look at all those magazines you have. Right. Yeah, I had this crazy boss <laughs> this to me once. Yeah. Rick, I'm glad you mentioned that because that definitely stuck with me since our last conversation and how it it's a, creates a something that lasts a long time, but it's also a wow factor that you're paying attention to the person, mm -hmm. you know, and it means something to them. Yeah. Well, when I first started professionally, um, there was a book by Tom Peters and another gentleman, um, and I can't remember, Peter or something, you know, Tom Peters and somebody else. I don't remember the other person's name. Anyhow, it, it was called In Search of Excellence, and it was called Management by Wandering Around. Now imagine that I'm 28 years old at this point, mm -hmm. and um, I have um, a, a cohort, a group of, of employees, people that I work with that are young women and a lot of young guys, so young people. And so what I would do is I would spend an hour a day, um, and I would walk around the entire place and go talk to people. And often what I would do, because they had you know, chairs and this was a big cavernous area, um, is I, I would give them a ride on their chair. And as I, <laughs> as I physically pushed them around, That's I awesome. asked them questions. And it, it's, you know, I, I think that being normal is boring. Right. I think that you have to step outside the bounds yeah. of, uh, you know, you can't be unprofessional and talk in the way you talk to people or yeah. overly personal. Right. But you, you basically have to realize that the people that are there doing a certain job, that's only part of who they are. Right. And you get the most out of them if they come to understand you and, and why we're doing something in a vision. Yeah, yeah. Rick, this has been absolutely fantastic, hugely valuable. I always love chatting. And like I said, I'll stick by my words before we started, which is this could easily, even though you said, I don't have that much to talk about, this could easily go for four or five hours and I could make this the record interview, which I won't because you'll freeze your butt off. But I appreciate your time. Where should we point people towards to check out online about you, about the company? Well, I have a LinkedIn page mm -hmm. and I have about 500 LinkedIn people. So it's Rick Popowitz at LinkedIn or mm -hmm. something to that effect. And um, I have biocentrichealth.com, mm -hmm. which is our principal site. Yeah. Then I have about 15 other sites. <laughs> okay. So maybe ch check out biocentrichealth.com. Right. What last words, what do we want to leave people with after all this? Um, the direct response um, while sometimes referred to as junk mail is anything other than junk and that you should have a lot of pride in what you do um, and that it can be an absolutely amazing experience. It's something that I've done for uh, roughly 30 years yeah. and I hope to do it for 30 more. Yeah. Rick, thank you again. It's been, it's been great. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. You have a wonderful you day. You too. Okay, take care. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.